All right, guys, finishing up uh, the French Revolution here. Um, Napoleon, who is going to come to take over from the directory, he is going to um, move to conquer Europe. And he is going to make excellent progress until he makes the horrible decision to attack Russia. He goes into Russia with 600,000 soldiers. He comes out with barely 100,000. As a result, he is removed from the throne, and he will be sent to the island of Elba in exile. A few years later, he comes back. It's this grand, dramatic entrance back into Paris. King Louis XVII, who was reinstated, bails, and Napoleon um, becomes emperor again. But he's barely on the throne for 100 days when he is defeated at the great climactic battle of Waterloo. When it's all said and done, Napoleon is exiled again to the little island of St. Elba in the Atlantic where, where he will die. But Napoleon does some, has some positives for France. One, he begins to modernize France and get it out of the old medieval model. Number two, he advocates for public schools, not only for boys, but for girls as well, and he brings up the powerful spirit of nationalism, where a country doesn't need a king or a queen um, to become powerful, to rally behind. They can do it through their own national spirit. Here is pictures of uh, famous the Lion's Mound, where Napoleon was defeated by the Duke of Wellington. Uh, very neat battlefield you ever get a chance to go. And what the French Revolution does is the, you know, enlightenment starts in the cafes of Paris, it boomerangs um, to the Americas, and then it comes back. And the French Revolution will spark independence movements in Latin America and the Caribbean. From 1804 to 1824, the French, the Spanish, and the Portuguese monarchies, who will all be intertwined, much due to Napoleon and his brother, will be removed from the colonies. And the first one to talk about is the Caribbean island of Haiti, where the disenfranchised slaves will be led by a man named Toussaint Overture. And Toussaint is... Um, former African slave who not only could read and write French, but was taught his West African heritage by his dad. And since he's smart and, and a leader at the age of 48, Toussaint leads the Haitian slaves against their masters. And it turns out that he's a natural military commander, and they rebel, and they are able to fight um, you know, French forces and Span or originally Spanish forces. And while they gain victory, the slaves, however, are not free. They don't benefit from it very much at all. And while the F Spanish leave, several years later, Napoleon needs to use Haiti as a staging area for his army to go to Louisiana. Napoleon put his brother on the Spanish throne, so the Spanish colonies become French. And Napoleon is going to build up his forces, and, and once again, expecting another revolution, Toussaint Overture is asked to come to a house and negotiate where he is captured. He will die in prison, and there will be another rebellion. Um, eventually, Napoleon is going to give up on Haiti as he sells the Louisiana Purchase to President Jefferson. He gives up Haiti. The revolutionaries there will defeat French forces, they will defeat Spanish, they will defeat British, and eventually in 1820, they achieve their independence. And finally, after many years, the people of Haiti are free. They become the first non-slave state in the Western Hemisphere. Originally, their independence didn't benefit them, but now um, it does. 
And so we have a problem with social hierarchy here. And we have a couple things. Number one is a Creole. And a Creole is a European noble born in the New World. So they are like second string nobles. And they are fighting for peninsulares, a noble born on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain or Portugal. Well, many people will flee Europe during the revolutionary period, French nobles, Spanish nobles, you name it. And they will come to the New World and take Creole jobs. And this comes into play when Spain needs money to fight Napoleon. We're going, going back in time here. Napoleon will ask Spain permission to travel through to attack Portugal. When he wins on his way back home, he attacks Spain. Well, the king, Frederick II, needs to, more money for his army. Rather than increase the taxes on his own people in Spain, he increases taxes on his colonies. The very same thing that King George did um, to the American colonies. Apparently nobody pays attention in a world history class. And the Spanish colonies in South America don't like this. And the first region to assert its independence is Argentina. When Argentinian leader Jose de San Martin will lead locals against a British garrison encroaching on their territory. And the Argentinians win. And they turn and look at the Spanish military, what was supposed to be there to protect them. And Argentina had to pay a tax for the Spanish forces. And Martin says, why are we paying? The Spanish didn't help us defeat the British. We did it ourselves. So why don't we become an independent country? And so Martin will lead Argentinian forces into Uruguay and Paraguay. And he will lose several battles. But each battle is so costly, the Spanish withdraw. And when Paraguay declares its independence, Martin will take his forces over the Andes Mountains to Santiago, Chile. In 1817, he arrives after the tough trek. He builds transport forces, and they take him to Peru. And when he drives out the Spanish in 1820, exactly when Haiti achieves its independence from Spain, Spain is driven out of two-thirds of South America. Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and now Peru. The Spanish stronghold is faltering. Spanish arrived there first. They had landed in Peru with Francisco Pizarro, and they are being dominated. They're being kicked out of the land they once controlled and made millions and millions of dollars off of. Simultaneously, when um, San Martin is working from south to north, in Venezuela is liberator Simon Bolivar, who's trying to free Venezuela from Spanish control. He leads an UNTA or a coup in 1810 in Caracas. It fails, and he is sent to... to um, he's exiled to a prison in the Caribbean. He comes back several years later in 1814. In the middle of his revolution, a civil war breaks out, and royalists capture him and exile him again to the Caribbean. But he comes back. If it doesn't work, try and try again. He comes back, and he finally is successful in 1816. He kicks the Spanish out, and Bolivar is known um, as the father of independence in Latin America. Now the revolution takes until 1821, but he is named the first president of Venezuela. And then in 1822, the two Latin American liberators, Bolivar and Martin, meet in Ecuador, and they liberate it from Spain. And it's at this point that they sit down and they have a discussion. What is the best government for South America? Jose de San Martin wants monarchies. Bolivar wants democratic republics. Bolivar says, no, man, we can't trade one monarchy for an another. So we're going to have democratic republics here. In an interesting turn of affairs, Jose de San Martin leaves to live in Spain. 
a country he fought against and kicked out of his um, continent. And Bolivar will take over. He'll defeat all remaining Spanish forces by 1824, and the longest reigning colonial empire in the America is, Americas is gone. And he is known as the George Washington of South America as a result. Simon Bolivar is the George Washington of South America. And this brings us to Mexico. While the Spanish are out of South America, they still have a strong presence in the north. And a Creole priest, Father Miguel Hidalgo, wants to lead a land reform movement because many of his parishioners are dirt poor. So he plans to lead a group to Mexico City to protest. And on the way, he picks up more and more and more people until all of a sudden 80,000 of them join him on a march to Mexico City. And the Spanish government gets worried and they send out the army. Father Miguel Hidalgo is captured, he is executed, and his body is left in an intersection to warn the people off. Don't come any closer. Go home. Well, by killing Father Hidalgo, he becomes a martyr, and the poor people become more impassioned and inflamed, and he is, Hidalgo is followed by Father Jose Pavon, who's a little more radical. For the next couple years, the poor parishioners and the Spanish army trade atrocities until Father Pavon is captured and executed in 1815. And at this time, there's events going on over the world. Napoleon has lost in Europe. But there's a civil war starting back home in Spain. There's problems down in Haiti. Jose de San Martin and Simon Bolivar are rebelling against the Spanish in Argentina. And Spanish royalist Augustin de Iturbide in 1820 sees Spanish power declining. Now, Iturbide is a royalist, but he is, he's a Creole who doesn't want to lose his social position, his power, and his way of life. So in 1820, he declares Mexico independent from Spain during an uprising in Mexico. So the Spanish monarchy has no more say in Mexico. It becomes its own independent nation, and Iturbide is the new president. But there is no difference, all right? The poor people are still stuck. Spain is not in charge, but it's Mexican or Spanish nobles there. So in Haiti and in Mexico are the two revolutions where the poor people don't benefit one um, iota. Spain is gone, but Iturbide, the new Mexican president or dictator, is in control. And this brings us full circle back down to Brazil, where the Portuguese monarchy has fled Napoleon's invasion in 1807. They leave for their big colony of Portugal. And they get there, and they're like, wow, this place is bigger than Portugal, it's greener, we have more resources. Brazil is the new home of the Portuguese crown. We're going to build our palace there. This is now the Portuguese kingdom. And the people say, okay. Several years later, the people say, hey, can we be our own democratic independent republic? You guys keep your power and your title and your wealth. And the Portuguese monarchy says, okay. So Brazil is the one painless, bloodless revolution during this period. And so when it's all said and done, the revolutions all begin with a popular power base from the middle to lower classes. Those are the ones that fuel the revolutions. Going back to Aristotle, he who controls the middle class will win. They can pull the lower up and the upper down. What Tiberius Gracchus did, appealing to the people, the middle class, there's more of them, whether it's the third estate or the slaves in Haiti or the poor people of Mexico, you control them, you're going to win your revolution. And nations feel that they should be defined by their own character, by their own history. A monarch means nothing. Our own current history, what we do, not what happened hundreds of years ago, is what is important. The United States becomes a new nation, democracy, the 
first time since La Republic in Rome. France shows the world what a nation who has its resources mobilized for war behind one single person can do. And Latin America says, let's look at our historical past when we were Mayan, when we were Aztec, and we were Incan. Be proud of our heritage, not some European empire. And this feeling of revolution will translate from America to France to Latin America to Germany in a period of nationalism. An idea that will definitely change the world when we are talking about very soon. So that's a wrap on Latin American revolutions Monday. I'll hit the Industrial Revolution quickly, and it should be a pretty good day. All right, guys, I'll see you Monday.